we're here at the Garden and Mill Cottage Gallery, 36 James Lane in East Hampton, talking about our current exhibition, Rare and Historic Paintings of Long Island. We have uh, very, uh, quite a few very rare Moran paintings. In fact, on this wall where we're standing, we have a very, very rare Peter Moran. The last time it's been seen publicly is in a 1998 exhibition of the Moran Family Legacy at Guild Hall. But anyway, Peter Moran, as you can see, was a very accomplished painter of um, livestock. He was probably the most famous painter of livestock in the country in the beginning of the 20th century. And he was also a teacher at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts for, I don't know, over 30 years. But in any event, uh, in this current exhibition, on this wall we have not only the painting by Peter Moran, but we have on both sides paintings by his nephew, Leon Moran, who lived on Egypt Lane. And um, this is a great painting of uh, very different than his typical, um, you know, colonial style paintings that he did. He painted this picture for himself and you can see you know, really resembles the way life was here in the 19th century in, in East Hampton. On the other side of this Peter Moran painting, we have this painting by Percy Moran. I'm going to take a, a better look at it, maybe from over here. Percy Moran, when he did this painting in 1909, uh, it became a sensation. There was a revival of the American Revolution, Percy Moran rendered this painting and over 30,000 prints were made of it. And it made Percy Moran a household name. The painting significance is that, you know, it, it is probably the best known of all the Morans, even any of the Thomas Moran paintings, because it received so much public accord. The thing about it was that soon after it was painted, and it was painted possibly right in this house where we're standing, Okay, Percy Moran lived here in, in, in this property at this time. And not long after he painted it and made the prints, the Strong Museum up in Rochester purchased it. And they held it for well over a hundred years. And one day I received a phone call from them and they asked me if I would be interested in acquiring it from them. And so uh, I made arrangements and I was able to get it. So it's a painting that's very, very rare and the fact that not only the subject matter but also the fact that it very very rarely gets exhibited. In a current exhibition here at the Gardner we have three very rare paintings by Paul Moran. Paul Moran only lived till he was around 40 years old and he did very few paintings, mainly because he was unhappy being a painter. In fact, his father, Thomas Moran, said of him, when he told me he wanted to be a musician, he said, listen, I'd rather you be a terrible musician, but a happy musician, than a great painter, but a happy painter. Anyway, Paul Moran divided his time between, you know, or orchestration, music, and Art. And this particular piece here was, was rendered in uh, 1891 and it's a portrait of his mother. The painting is very, very rarely seen, although a few years ago, in 2019, it was exhibited up at the Long Island Museum in Stony Brook at the exhibition called Face to Face, Artists Painting Other Artists. They had a, an exhibition up there and, this was one of the main stages of the exhibition. But this is a great likeness of Mary Moran, uh, Paul Moran's mother, the great etcher uh, that she was. And we can see here a very serious kind of, you know, look on her face, very staring straight ahead. But what struck me most about this piece was a title. And the title, they titled it and exhibited at the National Academy of Design was 
La Belle Dame Sans Merci were the beautiful lady without mercy. And I think that says it all for Paul Moran with this particular picture. As I mentioned, we have two other examples here today by Paul Moran. And this one is of a rendering of his sister. And she's around 16 or 17 years old at that time. And what we can see from this picture is the competence that uh, Paul Moran had as far, as far as anatomy, the shading in the eyes, and just the overall composition. I mean, he, you know, as I said earlier, he, he was not happy as a painter, but he was a very, very good painter. On the other side, we have this particular picture here, uh, which is a very, very important painting by Paul Moran because it is in the interior of the Moran household over on Main Street, which is uh, in East Hampton, okay? And it's titled by Special Delivery. It was rendered in 1899. And this, the interior is the Moran house. We see the two sisters, Mary Scott Tass and Moran, whose portrait uh, we just looked at, and Ruth Moran sitting on the other side of the table with a very dismayed look on her face. And the reason they called it, and he called it uh, by special delivery, and it was exhibited at the National Academy of Design in 1899, is because the girls have just received word through a telegram about the death of their mother, Mary Moran. And if you look closely, you'll see Mary Scott Moran, is she's reading the letter to her sister about the death that, uh, of, her, of, her, of her mother, which occurred out in Montauk when Mary Moran contracted typhoid, she, helping the soldiers at the Spanish-American War. She went out to Montauk, helped them, uh, one of the girls had typhoid. She survived, but unfortunately Mary Moran didn't. But if we look closely at the composition, and if we've ever been in a Moran house, we see this big picture window that's there, and we see her reading the letter to her sister. And on the table, we see the sketch pad of a mother and the mother's dress with the flowers. And historically, this is probably the most important painting uh, of young Paul's career. Like I said, he only lived till he was around 40 years old and he unfortunately passed away at a very early age. In our current exhibition, we also have two very rare paintings by Annette Moran, who was the wife of Edward Moran. The basic family structure was the four Moran brothers, Edward Moran, Peter Moran, John Moran, who was a photographer, and Thomas Moran. All of them had wives and children that painted, which really opened up the family tree. This particular painting has only been exhibited twice in its 140 year history. Once at the Moran family legacy at Guildhall and at another time at the National Academy when it was painted in 1880. And as I said, it's painted by uh, Annette Moran and what makes it so special, except, aside from the rareness that it's in Annette Moran, we don't see very many paintings by her, is that it's Mary Moran in her garden. And we see her watering away, and it's a great uh, rendering of her and exactly what she looked as, as a very young woman in 1880. As far as we know, this is the only collaboration between Edward Moran and Thomas Moran. And we have a written letter uh, which I purchased many years ago and sold to a collector and now is part of the East Hampton Historical Society collection stating it's a letter from Edward Moran stating that he was the one and only teacher of Thomas Moran. In any event, this is a very, very rare etching. We don't know if there's any others that exist aside from this. So the only one I've ever seen in the last in third, you know, since I've been in business, which is in many, many years. Uh, anyway, it's a, an etching by Thomas Moran, we can see, as you can see, signed here is signed Thomas Moran, of a painting that Ed, Ed, Edward Moran painted 
called the White Squad Squadron Salute to John Erickson. And he did the painting in 1890, probably shortly after that, Thomas Moran started the etching. So we see the collaboration, really an important collaboration between the two, between the two brothers. Uh, one who was the most important marine painter of the 19th century, Edward Moran, and then of course Thomas Moran, painter of the West, going outside what he typically did, doing this seascape, this, this, this type of action picture, if you may, uh, by, by his brother. Included in the exhibition here at the Gardner is this very, very rare watercolor by Thomas Moran. Now, Thomas Moran is known better for his renderings of the West. He was called Yellowstone Moran, uh, mainly because his big pictures helped, you know, the, helped uh, gain the national park system and, his, and it was, I think they're still hung in Congress. But in any event, um, what's unusual about this small watercolor, and he did tons of them in the 1880s and 1890s, and a tremendous amount of them in Montauk. I think they went out to Montauk, they probably spent a day out there and they probably enjoyed themselves. Most artists, when they went to Montauk, they painted the sunsets. In this particular example, we see sunrise. And Thomas Moran is capturing this sunrise from Rocky Point, which is on the far side of Culloden Bay. And he's looking up towards where the manor is. The manor would be sitting right up on the top of this hill here. Um, and he gets it just early in the morning and uh, is able to, when you first, when I first got this picture, I thought maybe it was a sunset. But then as I started to study and I know the topography there, uh, we realized it was a very rare sunrise painting. So, In the exhibition here at the Gardner, we have this fine example, this fine etching by Mary Nimmo Moran. Now, Mary Nimmo Moran was considered the foremost etcher in America, and she learned from her husband, Thomas Moran, learned drawing from him. She started her first etchings were done around 1879. This particular etching was done in 1880, and it's called uh, an old homestead East Hampton. And it's possibly you know, one of the earliest possibly in the first etching she did in East Hampton. And we're talking about a person that is only working, uh, you, know, uh, you know, drawing and studies and etchings for a very short time. And we look at the detail in this. And we, we would think that this was an artist that was doing this for, for years. But in fact, it is one of the earliest ones that she did. Now the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa they have the largest collection of Morans. They have two of these images, but I'm not sure if they're pencil signed or not. And that's the rarity of it is not only that the fact that it's done early in 1880, but the fact that it's also pencil signed. It shows that she either it was either for herself or she gave it to somebody, but she thought it was important enough to sign, which is, which is not that common at that time. Included in the exhibition here at the Gardner is this exceedingly rare rendering of Montauk. If we look here, we see the way Montauk was back in 1930. This is Duryea's dock, comes out here. We look at the old fishing village where people lived. And the school is on top of the hill, was, was built around 1930. So we're able to date the painting by that time. Also, we see the trains for the fish Angrela, where people come out and go fishing, the old government docks, and just how bare the landscape was here at that time. This is an extremely rare painting of Fort Pond. Yeah, there, by 1930, there was photography, and there are pictures of this. But when Harry Schokler, who was an artist that well, lived and worked for a great deal in Pennsylvania. When he came out here to spend whatever time he spent, 
He must have realized that he would be painting this for posterity and that this would be something that would be stand for the test of time as a very, very rare item. And um, if we looked at today, I mean, we can only imagine with a lot of these docks are gone, uh, what, how life must have been out there in the old fishing village. And we're looking here at a painting by Arthur Courtley. Arthur Courtley lived till he was around 45 years old. He went to Europe and uh, got ill and he passed away at a very young age. But what's important about Arthur Courtley is that he was an original member of the Tile Club. The group of artists that first came out in the 1870s to extend the railroad, you know, by by uh, doing renderings for picturesque America and for trying to promote the East End of Long Island. This particular painting has a great deal of a historic importance in that if we look here at the composition, we see a, a bunch of uh, boats that are heading uh, east. This is the fish factory here in Amagansett. And these boats were used to capture Manhattan or Bunker, if you will. And what they would do is, you could see here where the guys could stand up in the top here to see the fish because they would go be on the surface of the water flipping their tails and that's how they would find them. And then the, what they would do is they would encircle them with nets, they would capture them and they would bring them over here to the fish factory. And then what they would do is after they dropped their fish off, they would head into Culloden Bay because it was a deep water port, and that's where the fishing village was at that time. So uh, we're looking here probably, uh, the painting was done around 1880, and we're looking at the end of the day, the fishermen dropped off their catch. We see the smoke going, and we know that they're, you know, they're burning the fish off. And what they would do is they would melt the fish down, and they would use them for fertilizer. This is another painting by a much more contemporary artist. This painting was done maybe in 1960. And what it depicts, it's called, it's called Osprey Nest Promised Land. And what this is, is these are the actual railroad cars that would take the oil and transport it west to the destinations that they were using to uh, make uh, you know, fertilizer or whatever they were using it for. And so, uh, we're basically seeing a painting here from 1880 and a painting here 80 years later, the remnants of these railroad cars which were still being used. You know, in the 1870s we saw a lot of painters come to this area and a lot of paintings. Primarily they painted the, you know, barns, they painted farms, they painted the pastures, they painted thatched cottages, they painted the windmills, they went to the lighthouse, they painted the ceremony, they painted all over. But we very rarely see an interior painting of a windmill like we see here by John Ferguson Weir. John Ferguson Weir, uh, was probably his most accomplished painting from this area was Beach in East Hampton. It was a large work and it was publicized a great deal. In fact, at the garden here, we have a study for the painting, uh, which is small, uh, but it is still in the same palette as this. And here we look here at the Gardner windmill, which is right next door here to where we're standing. And we look at it, we look across, and we can see the, the hill over where Thomas Moran's house is. And we see the things that are inside that you'd see the, the sacks of you know, uh, grain, things that they had, on the rags, the hat, the, just the way it looked. Uh, there were not a lot of photographs of the windmills at that time, especially the interior because people didn't think that much of them. Uh, but the thing that we look back today is say the wooden works, the way they, everything was put together and it was an important part of living here because without these mills, we, 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 we wouldn't have grain, we wouldn't have, you know, uh, things like that. And so it helped us in a dare little bit. But John Ferguson Weir was a teacher at Yale University. He was at the head of the painting department there. 
And uh, so he would make summer trips out here and he would paint these very intimate views like we see at either the beach or we, here. So this is just a, an extremely rare painting of the interior of a windmill. We do see outsides all the time. I'd like to say one of the stars of the show here for this uh, current exhibition is this portrait of young Jacqueline Bouvier done in 1950. And this painting has not been exhibited very, very often, but it has quite a notorious history in that uh, I personally purchased this painting from an antique dealer on Newtown Lane back in 1990. And uh, about 10 years later, when the Hampton Magazine was starting, a lady that I knew was writing an article and she asked me if I had any interesting to write about. And I said, well, I do have this painting of young Jackie Bouvier, who of course lived at Lasada, and then she later lived in another house off of Egypt Plain. And I said, if you're interested, you could write about it. And she asked me to tell her something about the story. And I told her, I said, well, the painting is very unusual in that at the end of each summer, the society girls in East Hampton would go to Guildhall and they would get their portraits painted. They would pay for it, but they would, they would get them painted. In any event, Jackie's mother and father were not living together. The father was fallen on hard times, Black Jack Bouvier. And so Jackie went to her mother and asked her if she could have some money to pay the portrait painter. And the mother said, no, she said, ask your father. So Jackie went to her father, asked her father. The father said to her, listen, I, I don't have uh, any money right now. Uh, you're gonna have to do without the portrait being done this year. So she accepted that. That week she went out and she was riding a horse and she was thrown from the horse. And she was in, a lot of people don't know, she was in a coma for a few days and she came out of the coma and to make her feel better, her father hired a very good portrait painter, Erwin D. Hoffman, better than, far superior than the portrait painters that were going to Gold Hall. And he told her, he said, listen, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Hoffman paint your portrait. Um, I know it'll make you feel better. And so he, Hoffman came, he painted the portrait of her just the way she looked. The only thing that he did do is he left a little scar above her right eye uh, from the horsing accident. And so that's how we painted the portrait. When I purchased the portrait in 1990, I bought it from a woman in an antique store. And I walked into the antique store and I immediately knew who this person was. I mean, with the eyes far apart, I mean, and I'm not that well versed on uh, Jackie Bouvier, but I did know it was her. And come to find out that the painting was inherited by this woman that owned the antique store. Apparently, Jackie owned the painting and she had the painting. And she was on the East Hampton writing team. And the captain or the president of the team was a woman by the name of Teresa Shai. And her father was the, uh, he was the president of Guild Hall in the uh, 1940s. And in, in any event, Jackie decided that he would, she would gift the painting to this woman, who by the way, her partner was Ola Cassini, the famous designer. And she gave it to her as a gift. That woman passed away and she left it to her daughter who left it to her daughter, whose partner was the woman in the antique store and who had passed away and left the turn. So when the antique store was closing, maybe 10 years later, the surviving member of the partnership there came to see me in, in my art gallery and said to me, she had something for me. And then she gave me a box, she had, had a box, and the box 
had a box of photographs of Jackie when she was a child and she was on a writing team uh, of which I donated to the East Hampton Historical Society and then subsequently they had an exhibition at the Historical Society at Clinton Academy called Jackie on the South Fork. But anyway, this is the only time really that this painting has been exhibited, exhibited publicly. And um, it's just quite a great picture along with the other things that we have that we don't, you don't see that often. So I invite everyone to come over here if they get a chance.